she usually does the introduction. So, so I have a high standard to live up to. Yes. I introduced her. Um, but she's, um, she's um, as you know, she's been running a lot of these workshops. But this one's the last time you presented it at the workshop. No, I'm not, I was there, this is the very first time. The very first time. That uh, mm -hmm. I offer a presentation as part of the uh, series uh, mm -hmm. Center for Migration and Development. But that's because. Uh, I've often uh, participated in the organization, I think it's déclassé, put myself, put myself on the program. Okay. But I uh, did this time. Okay, good, good. So anyway, so Patricia, just, if you have, if you don't know it already, just of course, you know, always ask these very thought-provoking questions in all our talks. But besides that, she is, she's an intellectual and an activist, and I don't know how she does everything. Uh, she's very involved in immigration politics throughout the New Jersey area, and she's she's produced several books, including a couple that came out in the last year or two, uh, and you have about three more that are coming out. It looks like pretty soon, so it's pretty amazing. Uh, and uh, she's um, she's also, but that was her, is it your first book uh, that uh, became an Emmy award-winning film, uh, The Global Assembly Man. Uh, and so she's had this production, it's amazing. But if that's not enough, she also advises more undergraduate thesis than anybody uh, in the, in the um, department. And, uh, she's that's not a plus. <laughs> that's not a plus, but it's a plus. I mean, she produces these great theses. In this, in and this context, it could be taken as a plus. It's a plus for me? It's a plus, it's a plus for a lot of us. <laughs> and it's a plus for the department. And uh, so anyway, so so without um, going more and more about something that you probably all know very well. I am very excited to be here and to see so many dear and familiar faces, uh, including at least one of my favorite undergraduates. Uh, and I want to, uh, uh, and certainly many of my favorite graduates, graduate students, professors, associates of the CMD, my very dear uh, uh, partner in crime, Nancy Doolin, with whom I have uh, organized so many conferences. And, and by the way, speaking about conferences, um, we are going to be putting our heads together uh, to organize uh, a conference or roundtable we haven't decided yet on uh, uh, immigration and the military, which was Eddie's idea. Uh, but uh, uh, which I look forward uh, to organizing. And I want to uh, say just a word, uh, a special welcome to uh, Craig uh, Eugene Phipps uh, from Casa Esperanza. He's a guerrilla filmmaker uh, who follows me around. Uh, he represents uh, one of my absolutely favorite uh, activist organizations online. Uh, and so if you're interested in the people who are doing excellent work uh, regarding justice and immigration, uh, you may want to go uh, on Facebook uh, and look at Casa Esperanza's uh, uh, webpage. They do magnificent work. And so I thank you all for being here. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to present my latest paper, which is not uh, fully completed. Uh, and, edit, and I generally don't do this uh, because I do not believe in circulating drafts. Really, I don't. Uh, the reason is that people forget that they are drafts uh, and therefore proceed to offer critiques as if they had already been published for a couple of years. Uh, however, this time I did uh, uh, re uh, uh, respond. I think this is the very first time in my whole life when I have actually circulated a paper uh, in draft form. And uh, uh, some of you who are in Eddie's uh, seminar, with whom I look forward to having a longer conversation after the seminar, uh, have already read it. Uh, and as uh, you know, uh, it is still missing uh, part of the final section and the conclusions, uh, as well as uh, a full bibliography. Uh, but uh, I do uh, look forward to an opportunity to basically uh, share with you and who, with those who have not read the draft uh, what inspired me to write uh, this paper. The paper 
is really, uh, and I thought that the best way to do this today uh, is to just have that cover uh, uh, for the presentation. I'll just describe the content of the paper and then walk us uh, through some of the elements that I think are most uh, intellectually exciting to me. Uh, and then open the floor for conversation and for your suggestions. But if you did you if you found typos, uh, you, you have to understand I'm a little obsessive about this. If you found typos, kindly do not bring them to my attention. They will be corrected. Uh, although I try to be careful about these things. The main purpose of this uh, paper is to take stock of three bodies of literature uh, which have been uh, separate until now but which I argue in this paper uh, have premises or are founded on premises and offer findings uh, that buttress new understandings about the role of immigrant organizations in places of origin and settlement. Uh, drawing from writings on globalization, immigrant assimilation, and transnationalism, I try to create a synoptic model whose objective is to clarify the causes, the functions, and the evolution of immigrant organizations. It's a large uh, task ahead, but my purpose is not really to focus on the details of uh, individual organizations, but rather to use the fabulous research that has been accomplished uh, uh, recently under the CEOPS uh, project, uh, spearheaded by Alex Portis, uh, to really create some order and some understanding about the dynamics uh, that underline the formation of these transnational organizations and how they work, not just to do what we already know they, they do, which is to straddle borders and to uh, uh, connect uh, people in places of origin with institutions and individuals and groups in places of destination and back and forth, uh, but also to understand uh, beyond their developmental uh, functions, uh, other functions that they may they can be fulfilling. Uh, so it occurred to me that one good way to do this is to sort out major findings uh, from empirical uh, research uh, around two hypothetical axes, which I'll show you later uh, in a figure. Uh, but uh, this is what the figure is all about. I consider first a horizontal vector, which of course is imaginary, uh, constituted by the actions of immigrants as part of organizations aiming to adjust to constraints and incentives both in countries of origin and in areas of settlement. And I note uh, the historical shifts uh, that immigrant organizations tend to experience over time. Uh, regardless of national proven provenance. One of the things that is very interesting to me is how, although the details vary, uh, evolution tends to follow a, a particular pattern, uh, whether these are Congolese and Belgium and France, uh, or Moroccans and Spain, or indigenous populations uh, in California uh, from Oaxaca, uh, they all tend to follow uh, a similar pattern. In early stages of settlement, uh, many of these organizations tend to be responses to political, socioeconomic, and even natural upheavals in countries of origin. Earthquakes and floods have often been responsible for the formation of uh, organizations uh, in the United <laughs> States. Uh, they are formed by individuals uh, who strive uh, to maintain their connections with the motherland uh, but also East settlement uh, in their adopted country. So from the outset in this paper, I want to signal the dual uh, uh, dynamics of these organizations, which are not just about adaptations to place of destination, uh, but also about the uh, retaining connections in places of origin. But as time passes and immigrants adjust to new conditions, organizations address other questions including the search uh, for standing in the adopted nation. Uh, this is important because even professionals uh, tend to see their degrees and credentials devalued uh, in countries of arrival. Uh, this is particularly important in the case, for example, of uh, immigrants from Africa, who I will stress uh, uh, for reasons that I'll mention uh, later, uh, because, uh, say for example, Nigerians or Kenyans who tend to come from professional uh, 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 milieus 
uh, and who therefore in places of destination uh, tend to face uh, a, a double whammy uh, in the sense that their credentials are not immediately recognized, but also they tend to be processed and folded into an African-American category, uh, which they often try to distance themselves from. Uh, professional and alumni associations are examples of this kind of organization uh, seeking to maintain dignity and uphold status. Uh, financial, in, both, in these cases, uh, they mobilize resources at both ends of the geographical spectrum. By resources, I'm referring to financial, human, and cultural resources to buttress action, strengthen social ties, uh, gain political power, or foster cultural repertories uh, that are instrumental in attracting public respect. Uh, here, uh, I also want to point out that uh, a second purpose of the paper is to emphasize the role of social class in the characteristics uh, of these organizations. Uh, highly educated groups, uh, including exiles, integrate to display their superior credentials even <coughs> when those are not fully recognized or valued in the country of destination. Uh, those organizations, I see from the research conducted, <coughs> tend to be proactive, and here the language fails me because I am not saying that working class organizations are not proactive, but I must distinguish their fundamental strivings in some way. Uh, so I use the term proactive in a narrow sense of the word uh, to indicate adjustments to the constraints imposed by receiving states. Uh, a, by contrast, uh, skilled and semi-skilled immigrants are more likely to cluster in hometown associations and emphasize their connections with the country of birth. Uh, those organizations often fulfill a defensive function by contrast to proactive, although the two adjectives can be used uh, to designate uh, different activities that occur both in professional organizations, for example, and uh, in more humble organizations or hometown associations. The idea of defensive functions is to shelter members from prejudice and marginalization in host societies. They also preserve a sense of belonging in, community of or in communities of origin and are often instrumental, as we'll see in a moment, in the creation of ethnic and pan-ethnic uh, identities in receiving uh, countries. Now, uh, here's the third element that the paper aims at emphasizing. Uh, so it's not uh, uh, just the, the social class composition, it's also the way in which these organizations uh, relate to state bureaucracies, both in countries of destination and in countries of origins. Regardless of class composition or state of uh, stated objectives, organizations form by first-generation immigrants and their descendants are shaped significantly by incentives or the absence of incentives emanating from states, from national states, uh, both in countries of origin and countries of uh, destination. In some cases, the state itself is instrumental in their <coughs> formation. And here I want to signal just very much a uh, reference in passing uh, the, the very important role of European states in the formation of not-for-profit and grassroots organizations uh, to such a large extent that researchers in the, those countries cannot imagine uh, transnational organizations which do not function uh, without uh, the action of the state. But I will not be giving much attention in this presentation uh, to those uh, state-formed grassroots organizations. Uh, I, I will reference, however, the very important work of Natasha Iskander for this project that shows how very often in her study, uh, concretely of the Tres por Uno program in Mexico, uh, it, it is uh, public officials that directly form the organizations in order to uh, connect with constituencies in the United States, uh, and to gain support for initiatives in Mexico. Uh, in some cases, therefore, the state itself is, an inst is instrumental in their formation uh, as governing authorities in various geographical areas aim to secure the loyalty of immigrants to pursue their own goals. In other words, uh, it is nearly impossible uh, to garner an adequate understanding of transnational immigrant organizations 
without attention to legal regimes and policies. So that by focusing on the horizontal dynamics of immigrant organizations spanning international borders, I seek to go beyond description. Oh, Marcus has arrived. Welcome, Marcus. We <coughs> love having you. Uh, and I seek to go beyond description in order to emphasize explanatory uh, factors. So that takes care, for those of you who have to leave early or wish to take a nap, uh, and the, uh, that takes care of the basic uh, framing uh, of this horizontal axis. But I must confess to you that as exciting as I find that conceptualization, uh, I find even more in, in interesting and enticing uh, the a vertical uh, axis uh, that I use to organize uh, the research on transnational organizations. Uh, and which focuses on the ways in which immigrant uh, organizations operate along a, a vertical vector constituted by first and second generation or even third generation immigrants. Because here is the question. It is not difficult to understand why newcomers, that is first generation immigrants, uh, might strive uh, to form associations to retain bonds to their ancestral countries or find shelter from discrimination in receiving areas. That is what immigrants have done with or without uh, organizations to back them up. Their children, however, uh, born or having gr growing up uh, in adopted nations, do not respond to the same stimuli. In, the, in their case, the proper research question is not uh, why uh, in second generation immigrants uh, don't uh, join transnational organizations, but precisely the opposite. Why should they even consider doing so? Why do so many children and grandchildren of immigrants, even if they are a small number and a small percentage of the total population, uh, would want to join transnational organizations? In other words, I'm not focusing here on quantity. Uh, I'm uh, uh, focusing here on the theoretical dimensions of transnationalism. And I consider that population of younger immigrants uh, who have grown up in places like the United States as what uh, Robert K. Merton would have designated as, as a strategic research site. Uh, in other words, we can learn from those uh, younger immigrants <coughs> a lot that we can, uh, not, and not just about immigrants, by the way, a lot that we cannot learn, uh, say, for example, from larger populations of immigrants who represent a particular flow, say, for example, uh, labor immigrants. Uh, so that is the question, why should they even care? And so that question forces me and forces us to go beyond transnationalism defined as a process to enhance economic development, which of course is important, <laughs> and that is where the emphasis has been placed <coughs> until now, transnational organizations as part of development strategies that are, or, or philanthropy uh, attached to it. Uh, but I want to also see these organizations as tools for the preservation of memory and the reinvention of self. In other words, this connects the literature on transnational organizations uh, to the literature on cultural sociology and uh, identity formation. Among the children of immigrants are numerous entrepreneurs and professionals, we know that, uh, their achievements, a living testimony of promises fulfilled in countries of settlement. Uh, endowed with material and symbolic, in fact some of them are here in this room, at least one I see, uh, and uh, uh, we know that they are in their accomplishments uh, a, a very important uh, testimony to the resources and the achievements that they have fulfilled in places of, of uh, destination. We know that many retain family and friendship connections uh, in places of their ancestors. Uh, research, however, uh, shows that utilitarian aims are only part of a more complex set of objectives uh, pursued by second and third generation immigrants. Uh, and here's, uh, in a nutshell, uh, what I think uh, we will be pursuing as a hypothesis, and that is the maintenance of a connection to the ancestral, uh, to the ancestral nation enables younger generations uh, to do a double a maneuver. Uh, on the one hand, to honor their progenitors, uh, their ancestors, uh, and, and to define their own identity and lands of uh, birth and residence. In the case 
of children born to refugees and exile. This operation takes uh, dramatic proportions uh, when you consider, for example, second generation Cubans and Vietnamese. These are generations uh, which must establish a very delicate balance uh, to pay tribute to their progenitors' experience of pain and displacement, while at the same time affirming their own self-distinction. Uh, for Nigerians and Koreans, yet another uh, two other uh, good examples, uh, groups that still experience uh, a sub subtle and overt forms of discrimination in the United States forging a bond uh, with the land of their kinsmen can operate as a means to separate from stigmatized groups in places of destination, both native and foreign born. Uh, from a theoretical point of view, therefore, the transnational <coughs> activities of children of immigrants point to new forms of adaptation founded not <coughs> just on the experience of physical relocation, but on the recreation of personhood and the forging of what Benedict Anderson calls imagined communities. Now that you have fully internalized the first slide of this presentation, now let me show you some primitive uh, 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 slides uh, that merely walk us through the literatures uh, that I am interested in. It was a pleasure while writing this paper uh, to go back uh, to writings by Volker Frugel, uh, uh, Jurgen uh, uh, of Volker, uh, Frogel, uh, Jürgen Hendricks, and Otto Kray, uh, because that book published in 1980 uh, was very much in my mind uh, when I did uh, research uh, uh, on the U.S.-Mexican border in Ciudad Juarez uh, towards the production of that first uh, global ethnography. It was a literature that focused very much on uh, the process of globalization and in that section of the paper, I review the literature of globalization simply to point out uh, that uh, scholars are not fully in agreement as to what the term means. Uh, our own Miguel Arkel <coughs> Centeno, uh, in that marvelous book uh, with uh, Joseph Cohen, uh, to say nothing about personal commentations and individual presentations, keeps us reminding, uh, keeps reminding us uh, that globalization really leaves out very large, large swaths of the world's population, and that it mostly occurs uh, among social actors uh, in the Western Hemisphere uh, and some parts of uh, Asia and Southeast Asia. I get it. I understand that. Then there is the question as to whether there is anything new on globalization. Writings by Foster and by Bob, uh, whose name I can't, uh, uh, Cohn and Cohen, see, I, uh, and uh, uh, Joseph Nye. Uh, uh, describe that point, uh, and I wanted to bring back uh, Emmanuel uh, Wallace in another book that had tremendous influence on my thinking, uh, and the very famous and classic uh, modern world system, because I think Wallace, following uh, many other um, uh, authors, uh, whose names I will not necessarily mention here, emphasizes uh, not just uh, uh, the temporal, but also the spatial uh, dimensions uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, of globalization. Uh, in, in, in a summary, uh, it, what the empirical research showed uh, is that internationalization, including what interested me most uh, uh, when I was younger, that is the relocation of manufacturing and the implementation of free trade agreements uh, inspired by neoliberal economics, which has defined uh, the relationship between institutions and civil society. Uh, and just a word to say what uh, most of you here already know, and that is that in this period of globalization, national states uh, uh, find, uh, for example, find it difficult to arrest capital flight or tax revenues generated by investments outside their borders, um, and, but yet they are charged uh, with the management of a long-standing uh, uh, and long-standing responsibilities. Uh, for example, the management uh, of uh, uh, displaced workers and the consequences of that labor displacement, which is not irrelevant to the study of transnational uh, organizations. Uh, so although our understanding of globalization uh, as a large-scale phenomenon has improved, uh, its effects are still under review. 
Uh, I do want to mention uh, Bill Robinson, not everybody's favorite scholar, uh, but uh, uh, someone who I think has made some important contributions uh, from a Marxist point of view uh, to our understanding of economic internationalization. And I do uh, consider very seriously the question that he asks uh, in one of his latest books, how do transnationalized populations reorganize their spatial relations from local uh, to global scales. To me, that is a fundamental question. In other words, how is it that the individual and local uh, activities of individuals translate uh, in a, a kind uh, of a global uh, uh, economic and political <coughs> phenomenon? Uh, and so I want to jump very, very quickly to a most inspiring statement that comes from one of my super duper favorite authors, uh, Saskia Sassen, uh, who, as I write in the paper, for those of you who have read it, uh, really is in my mind uh, the, the one scholar who has made the most signal contributions uh, to understand the relationship between globalization uh, and international migration. Uh, I take her point very, very serious, seriously that globalization and immigration must be understood as mutually constitutive processes. And what I argue in this paper and want to develop in the final version is the idea that this, these two processes, globalization <laughs> and international migration, uh, really converge uh, at, at the locus of a transnational organization. That, at, uh, not all immigrants are transnational, I get it. Uh, not all organizations are transnational uh, organizations, uh, but theoretically it is in those spaces and it, with those populations uh, that we can gain a better understanding of the relationship between in international migration and globalization. And uh, of course, one of the important arguments of the paper is that these are literatures that have remained for too long as specialized uh, fields for research, and that we should actually be considering them uh, more as complementary uh, than uh, anything. Now, I do, before, uh, there should have been another slide here to remind me uh, that the second body of literature that I give some attention to is that of assimilation. And here, uh, I really do want to emphasize how important uh, the literature on segmented assimilation is. A as some of you who are specialists know, uh, there is a debate on the subject. It's an interesting, fascinating, and most, most entertaining debate. But to me, the important thing that has to be salvaged is twofold. One of them is the idea that immigrants really do not assimilate into a mainstream social body, that they assimilate through personal interactions in specific locations. Uh, and that itself should be a, an insight that should be taken more seriously by more young authors uh, in the field. The second one is that there is also a certain level of segmentation among transnational organizations, not just in terms of class, but in terms of the functions that they fulfill as immigrants seek to adapt to places of destination. Uh, so I do give some attention to that literature. And then I turn my attention to transnationalism. Uh, and I begin with something that I will not show here, which is that very famous uh, vignette, vignette uh, mm -hmm. in uh, uh, Robert uh, C. Smith's uh, uh, dissertation uh, mm -hmm. describing mm -hmm. the uh, Tijuana Improvement Committee. Uh, Tijuana, uh, an acro uh, 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 pseudonym for a particular location, I believe, in Puebla, uh, where they are describing how happily they are inaugurating the new piping in their hometowns, except they're standing in Brooklyn. And as I, uh, uh, which is marvelous, the, the, the wording that he captured from his uh, interlocutors, uh, and the idea that we're sudden, uh, suddenly realize that we're not in Tijuana, Puebla. We are in Brooklyn, where these fine uh, gentlemen are actually celebrating the fact that they are both living in Brooklyn and that they are improving Tijuana. Uh, uh, Joe Arpaio and other <coughs> nativists should really not gain access to this information. Uh, but from a specialist uh, a point of view, uh, I do believe that that insight uh, was, uh, has been uh, very important in terms of uh, fostering new research uh, on the subject. Uh, the literature on uh, transnationalism, 
uh, and I am exaggerating and oversimplifying, but uh, you know there are basically two approaches, and I uh, kind of land in the middle of the two approaches. Uh, if you follow the line uh, 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 introduced by anthropologists uh, 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 Blake Schiller, uh, Blank Stanton, uh, Bosch, uh, uh, you are many of you here are already acquainted uh, with this definition of transnationalism as processes. Uh, by which immigrants forge and sustain multi-stranded social relations that link together their societies of origin and settlement. Uh, uh, this is a, a, a really a vintage anthropological uh, definition in that mm -hmm. it remains agnostic about specifics. Uh, and therefore, it, it is kind of difficult to operationalize it and to use it uh, to gain any kind of precision uh, and research. Uh, but intellectually, in my estimation, it's a very interesting definition because it allows us to bring in uh, cultural repertories and how they change or not as a result of uh, transnationalism. I do like this definition better, and I think it complements the other one uh, introduced by Cortez, Haller, and Warniso, which focuses not on the ideational fields of transmigrants, uh, as uh, the anthropologists call them, but rather on practices undertaken by immigrants which require the regular crossing of physical borders to generate revenue, mobilize political resources, or maintain or uh, produce uh, cultural uh, forms. So uh, this uh, uh, position where, whereby we connect uh, practices as well as ideational fields uh, is helpful to me. Uh, it, as these authors actually point out, uh, something in the order of, uh, if you follow the empirical research, uh, something in the order of 10% of immigrants are transnational, a very small proportion. Uh, on the other hand, as I expressed uh, before, uh, the um, number is less important than what they signify as part uh, of the new uh, landscape of, uh, of uh, immigration <laughs> and globalization. Uh, so uh, in the next section, uh, I do trace that evolution uh, from the images brought to mind by uh, Bob Smith, uh, Rob Smith, uh, to what is now happening uh, as a result of the uh, CEO pro project on transnational organizations uh, spearheaded by Portis and many associates uh, between 2010 and 2012 uh, is sponsored by the MacArthur Foundation. Uh, uh, it, it constitutes a collective form by nine research teams. It's an extraordinary effort uh, and a pioneer effort uh, uh, unified by a common purpose and research design. So here we have coming together uh, projects that are uh, focusing on immigrant uh, transnational organizations uh, in, in many countries, including India, China, Vietnam, uh, Mexico, Nicaragua, Colombia, Mor Morocco, uh, Congo, uh, well, actually, that's not, the Congolese in Belgium, in country of origin, Turks, and in uh, places of origin, and also in countries of destination is uh, wide flung as the United States, Spain, Belgium, France, Germany, and the Netherlands. Uh, we all wish we had uh, that kind of energy to coordinate all this. And I think that some of you were present earlier this year, uh, in April, I believe, uh, when there was a workshop that brought together uh, some of the final reports uh, of these teams. Uh, and it was an extraordinary experience. Uh, as I say, one of the consequences of this project, which would have been enough in my estimation, has been the creation of comprehensive inventories uh, of immigrant organizations in all those countries, both in places of destination and places of origin. Uh, I think that would have been enough and, very, and a very important uh, and interesting book. But uh, in addition, uh, that project aims to achieve much more. Uh, it represents the first ever examination of commonalities and differences among organizations uh, formed by immigrants of different nationalities in various geographical locations. Uh, so here I just uh, uh, want to uh, reference uh, uh, some of the uh, findings of some of the authors 
uh, who have uh, made uh, significant uh, contributions. And this is, although uh, it, it, it's hard to read, but this is basically the illustration for a section entitled Mapping Transnational Communities, in which I try to flesh out what I said before, uh, where you have uh, in areas of destination, transnational organizations uh, engage in such functions as easing settlement, uh, contesting prejudice, and recreating culture, uh, but also maintaining uh, contact uh, with places of origin, uh, and fostering economic development, uh, and participating in, uh, in political activities, and aiming at cultural uh, 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 preservation. Uh, now, the thing that uh, also interests me so much uh, has to do with the way in which the organizations uh, bridge uh, various uh, um, uh, points uh, between countries of origin and points uh, of, of destination. <laughs> Uh, this is a quote from a report by Iskander, uh, in, which illustrates uh, what I said before uh, in terms of what hometown <laughs> associations often do. Uh, but uh, uh, there is something similar happening, for example, in India and Vietnam, uh, according to reports by uh, Rina Agarwala and Han and uh, Jessica Yu, as part of the same project. Indian American <coughs> entrepreneurs, for example, have profitably used incentives deployed both in India and the United States uh, to build luxurious residential centers and uh, residential uh, settings uh, in the land of their ancestors. So you see this being reproduced across generations. Uh, what, uh, part of what interests me is that many of those residential um, uh, zones uh, or clusters and some of those commercial centers uh, feature magnified and altered elements derived from autochthonous traditions while at the same time boasting elements of modernity. Uh, they illustrate the use of, of local and regional cultures to simultaneously celebrate a glorious history and give evidence of, success, of a successful present. Uh, so, such constructions uh, manage temporal elements uh, to stir the imagination of local populations uh, but also confirm the achievement of uh, Indians in the United States. Uh, I don't think I need to elaborate uh, that when you are uh, 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 Frank uh, Patel uh, and you are investing in magnificent architecture somewhere in India, uh, you are not just honoring your ancestors and preserving a modified cultural legacy, because those buildings are fantastic in their creativity, uh, but you're also giving testimony of your success as an assimilated Indian American. That, that is part of what uh, uh, we are trying to understand. Uh, new temples, uh, I'll show you some, uh, uh, one, an image of one just now, uh, financed by Indian Americans in places like Gujarati and Andhra Pradesh, but also in Connecticut, New Jersey, <coughs> and Texas, I'll show you one, emphasize the peaceable, uh, because this speaks also uh, to the uh, to the connection, which I, I must I, I don't have time to emphasize here, uh, of another resource that is being used by these new generations, and that is religion. And of all the religions that are acquiring a transnational character uh, and giving rise to transnational organizations, my favorite, I admit, is Hinduism because uh, well, first of all, I was very interested in Hinduism since I was a child uh, and loved the images and the artwork around it, uh, but also because Hinduism is actually emerging as an international religion, uh, religion uh, that is green, th that is conscious of the environment, uh, that is inclusive, uh, that, is, uh, that combines elements that are amenable to New Age uh, believers, uh, and so on and so forth. So that, for example, the peaceable character of Hinduism uh, and the redefinition of uh, gods and goddesses uh, in order to incarnate values like courage, compassion, and respect for the planet are gaining currency among the new generations. And they enable uh, them to affirm continuity and discontinuity at the same time. Before I show you the final images and conclude this presentation, uh, let me also uh, emphasize the point of class. 
and that is, I've mentioned it before, and I did notice that alumni and professional organizations see as opportunities mostly to study proactive behaviors that enable people with uh, a large amount of skills and a high educational standing uh, to regain uh, status in places of uh, destination while at the same time maintaining uh, 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 identity in places of origin. For working class immigrants, the situation is somewhat different uh, because def uh, defensive organizations often aim at solidifying connections uh, with countries of origin, uh, partly as a process for salvaging identity uh, and uh, restoring dignity. Uh, in countries where they face limited uh, avenues for social mobility. There's a whole story behind that, uh, which we can discuss uh, later if, if you want. Uh, but what I want to emphasize is that these organizations also operate in a transnational field, but their motivations, relationship with national states, and effects differ significantly. They are often involved in the forging and contesting of racial and ethnic identities in receiving countries. And some of you are familiar with this image, uh, which is a figure created by Sasha Kranich, uh, University of Berlin, uh, with whom I worked closely on his dissertation uh, prospectus. Uh, and uh, we, uh, he created uh, a, a very uh, similar uh, figure. Uh, and I'm using it merely to illustrate a point. Uh, this focuses on indigenous organization, indigenous transnational organizations formed by Mayans and Tzotziles, uh people from Chiapas and Oaxaca. And what these, fig these squares are aim uh, aiming to show is the way in which the transnational organizations move in various directions, uh, both to salvage uh, identity in place of uh, destination, but to maintain connections in places of origin. Now, uh, the draft that some of you read uh, actually ends uh, uh, with uh, a description of uh, something that happened uh, to me uh, uh, earlier this year, and uh, in which uh, uh, one of my favorite students, I was teaching a course on religion and migration, uh, and uh, uh, this young student, uh, who I call Avinash Patel, that's not his real name, uh, entered my classroom. Uh, one of the things that is interesting about this young man is that he works at Tilak, uh, which is the masculine version of the red dot, the bindi, that uh, uh, Indian women uh, wear. So of course he caught my interest from the outset, not as a, only as a result of his good looks, but as a result of the uh, an intelligence, uh, but uh, uh, also <laughs> as a result of his appearance. Uh, and. Uh, uh, on this particular day, he enters my room and he tells me jokingly, I know my people are doing real well in this country. Uh, this was a, a joking reference to a point I had raised in an earlier lecture, and he continued by saying, I know because there's a new Hindu temple being built in my city, Boston. Uh, yes, we rule. Yep, we rule. Uh, so we laughed in unison, sharing an appreciation, the benefits of teaching undergraduates, uh, an appreciation of the irony uh, that, uh, uh, that was implicit, and that is a young man affirming his American identity by stressing the elements of religiosity inherited from his Indian parents. Uh, but what's even more interesting is that uh, as I proceeded uh, to write this paper, I went and did a little bit more research about uh, transnational Hinduism and discover, among other things, uh, this is actually a temple uh, that belongs to the large network of Hindu temples uh, named after the uh, Sri uh, Sri Sri Sai Baba, so, so it's, uh, the Sai Baba of uh, Shirdi. Uh, of which, uh, this one is actually, I couldn't find the version from New Jersey or Boston, uh, but this one is from Cedar Lakes uh, in Texas, very close, close to Austin. Now, as you can see, the architecture uh, has little to do with a traditional a Hindu temple, but a, tem a Hindu temple it is. Uh, and uh, it, 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 it is part of this very large uh, network to which mostly it's not just the first generation Indian <coughs> Americans that belong there, but their children and their grandchildren. And so it is that here is a, a figure of this uh, guru 
uh, Sai uh, Baba uh, uh, from Shirley, uh, whose birthplace and uh, date of birth uh, are not known, uh, late 19th century guru uh, of Akir. Uh, from Western India. Now it's interesting if you dig a little bit deeper uh, into this important guru, you understand why it has caught the imagination of younger people in this country because this was a man dedicated to peace and a man who is, worship, or who is remembered as a saint by both Muslims and Hindus. Uh, so again we see this coming together of very, very modern, even postmodern ideals of peace, inclusivity, internationalism uh, with a so-called traditional figure. Uh, and it is not just uh, traditional figures uh, uh, like the Sai Baba uh, that are important. I am particularly taken uh, by the many avatars that are now taking prominence in this modified uh, Hinduism, uh, including this handsome fellow <laughs> who is one of the avatars of Vishnu, Narasina, uh, who is half uh, a lion and half man. Uh, but symbolically and from the point of view of uh, culture and the reconstitution of culture, uh, this is an iconic image uh, because he is uh, a deity uh, that protects uh, individuals, especially in case of need. And so as most mortals are often in difficulty, uh, this uh, representation, again, emerges as a possible way uh, to unify many different religious beliefs into something uh, that connects uh, generations of immigrants and gives us an opportunity to understand both the economic uh, and political dimensions of transnationalism, but to me, equally as important, the re reconfiguration of culture as part of these uh, transnational processes. So I think I've taken exactly the amount of time, a miracle, that I intended to take. Uh, and uh, I look forward to your comments and to your questions and suggestions uh, for improvement. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so I'll field questions. No questions? Fine. <laughs> By the way, uh, as you are preparing to raise your hand, uh, and the program that is the colloquium series uh, features, uh, well, our director will be our next speaker, uh, so that will be on November 8th. Uh, then we will welcome Phil Kassanitz. Uh, but I did want to mention Peggy Levitt because her work uh, is very important uh, to this new understanding of uh, religion in a transnational field. So she will be here on December 13th. I'm interested in hearing more about uh, Hinduism as a universal religion or globalized economy. Or globalized economy. Well, it, it, please understand, I mean, Irina Arawala, because when I say that I never circulate uh, these uh, papers in draft form, uh, I really mean it, but I needed to share this one with her because uh, of that. Uh, and so uh, this is a new field of research for me, uh, and so you will have to forgive my sketchy deal comments uh, right now. Uh, but but my, uh, what, what, what interests me here is the idea that this is a religion that uh, originally was perceived as being somewhat primitive because of its polytheistic character, uh, exotic, uh, uh, occurring uh, in, in a field uh, uh, that preceded modernity, but that the way in which these uh, transnational religious organizations are redefining uh, Hinduism is as a more inclusive uh, uh, religion. And really, the inspiration for this was Rina uh, Agarwala's uh, report, uh, uh, because the, uh, the avatars and the different uh, deities uh, now come to be redefined uh, not as gods and goddesses, but rather as representations of values, uh, like courage, uh, like uh, uh, determination, uh, like hard work, etc., etc. Uh, the avatar that I just showed is especially interesting to me because he appears uh, very frequently and appears to be gaining prominence uh, among Hindu Americans. Uh, 
among uh, Indians in these uh, temples, you see. Uh, the image of uh, my student is also evocative in that uh, part of what he was saying with his appearance is not just that he's Indian, but that he is religious. So this is also a way, a path for newer generations uh, to capture a series of religious convictions outside mainstream organized the religious. So I think that's the path. I mean, that's about as much as I know so far, but I'll get back to you when I learn more about it. Um. That's interesting because I've always thought that uh, the rise of monotheism was uh, almost an athlete. The Roman Empire was probably the first real attempt at globalism. It wasn't global, it was really Mediterranean, mm -hmm. but it embraced all kinds of cultures, all mm -hmm. kinds of people. When the Romans came in, and after the conquering of the, of the Roman battles, they didn't persecute people because they had yeah. religion. They just incorporated in the pantheon. They do worship your God, they right. worship mine. It was very inclusive with all of my values. But, but, but that's interesting because... And then Christianity comes along, and then Islam comes along. Yeah. And uh, then it matters what you believe. And yes. uh, lots of people end up dying in the name of religion. Yeah. But, but, but so you can see uh, what marvelous paths Hinduism uh, uh, offers precisely because it's more similar to the Roman approach to religion than, than it is to Christianity. And that may be a very, very good thing. It's also very colorful. <coughs> yes? I guess on that note, um, I, I really love this presentation. I like how you integrating art history. Thank you for the, coming to uh, Into the presentation. I, I had a question on, kind of in that vein of how um, you have these nation states that are that are um, created and and how immigration uh, can allied those national boundaries when when uh, not only immigrants but immigrants children um, and descendants end up you know sort of having to habitate the United States for example how that um, that nation state boundary is is challenged, um, and if, if you got into any of, of that in, in your sort of well, literature. there is a literature that, that I don't need to get so much into it here, mm -hmm. because there is a literature that very intelligently notices several things. One is that uh, the, the borders may be challenged uh, at the same time that they are reaffirmed. Right. Uh, so it's, it's an interesting maneuver there because they are challenged uh, by capital as it moves uh, uh, to overseas locations and it's challenged uh, with very, very different levels of power by workers, for example, who cross them without having legal documentation and in search of employment, yes? Uh, but they are constituted uh, and reaffirmed, for example, when you look at what remains of the most important functions of national states, which is the management, uh, for example, of displaced workers, the whole carceral, the expansion of, uh, of, of the jails and prisons. And it matters because, interestingly, it is those states that at a time when labor is more mobile than it has been probably in the history of humanity, uh, there are still very important restrictions uh, for uh, the admittance of uh, immigrants uh, in many countries. And, it, and I think they also play a role in, in managing remittances and in, in the counting itself. Exactly. Mm -hmm. so, so, so what is distinctive of the present moment is both is, is, is a uh, weakening of uh, borders uh, uh, in certain uh, dimensions like economic and political dimensions. Uh, and a strengthening of borders from a point of view of legal regimes, for example, and citizenship. Uh, this is a contradiction that probably cannot be sustained, uh, but uh, we have not yet seen uh, any serious movements uh, that uh, suggest uh, that there is some kind of uh, organized mobilization, uh, for example, to redefine citizenship. Mm -hmm. uh, but all these are, are nonetheless very important subjects for conversation among specialists. Uh, I, don't, um, I also had a question about hometown associations and, and while they play this sort of dual role of honoring the past and, and you know, forging a new future, um, they're, what you see in their, in their effect on the ground in certain communities um, and how is a, there has been some literature on how they have a maybe negative effects um, in terms of power relations sure. and sovereignty and well like everything else 
there are winners and there are losers. Uh, and uh, yes, for example, the, the, the nice papers on uh, uh, the effect of remittances uh, on inequality at the local level, it does create it, right? Mm -hmm. On the other hand, it's very good for the people who receive the remittances. Professor Kelly, I'd like to ask you, in your conceptual model, uh, at the vertical vertex, which I find most fascinating, um, and how it helps us understand the connection of the second generation to their ancestral land and formation of new identities. And you mentioned that you find, um, informed by Cortes and his collaborators, that Vietnamese and Cubans have uh, a more nuanced and delicate way of relating to both the host and the nation of reception and the exception of origin. Will you include in the future in your model also within this vertical axis or vertex um, the how uh, the children of immigrants who are non-white and who are racialized, the, the racial, one, racialized, yeah, no, children of very immigrants will also have some sort of parallels? No, no, it, 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 they are very central to this. As much as matter of fact, Ogashi, Ogeshi, sorry, mm -hmm. Cecilia Ogeshi Opara uh, has been a very important source of inspiration here. She's writing her senior thesis on uh, Nigerian remittances. So when she first came to my office to tell me about Nigerians sending remittances to Nigeria, I thought she was joking, literally. Uh, it turns out that Nigerians are very, very much involved in remittances, and I have uh, suggested to her, and I'm not sure that I have persuaded her, but she's doing the research, she'll get back to you, uh, that part of the reason is that uh, sending remittances to Nigeria um, maintains and fosters and buttresses your Nigerian identity exactly. uh, because uh, these are young people who rightly uh, uh, feel very, very much that their uh, very high educational standing and professional standing uh, uh, must be maintained uh, and uh, they must maintain some kind of distance vis-a-vis -vis the African-American stereotype. This is not the first time that we see this. Mm -hmm. Haitians do that all the right. time. Right. Uh, Jamaicans, uh, uh, other uh, Afro-Caribbean populations, uh, because uh, the, uh, the, the black stereotype in the United States is so heavily... Uh, 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 Thank you, yeah. Professor, who studies race. Right uh, I, I was going to find uh, an even more uh, dramatic word as in leveling. It really does. It's not fun. Uh, and, and when this happens all the time, right, uh, that, uh, uh, that, that you are at risk uh, of disrespect or hostility, uh, especially when you're young and you're out there in the world, uh, and, and people really cannot uh, tell the difference. Because all of us, actually, uh, except that we are often not conscious, we are all actually treated in the world uh, with some reference to our own uh, educational, uh, locational, uh, and professional uh, standard. So yeah, that, that is very, 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 very important to us. Yeah. And it is, I think, I, I, I don't know, I mean, I've worked, uh, uh, if, if it's not clear in the paper, then I will uh, uh, add uh, that it's a very important thing. Uh, you mentioned an example of your student and how he used religion. Did you like my example? I did. I loved it. Um, <laughs> about, about, That's um, not his name. <laughs> about how second generation immigrants use um, religion as a way to connect to the ancestral land. My question is, how does that process work with, I guess, second generation immigrants who may not identify with their religion? Right. Well, religion is just, uh, I, I, I neglected to mention it in my presentation, but that's the reason why I do, like a million other people, like Anne Swidler's understanding of culture as a toolbox mm -hmm. uh, that allows you to make sense. Because when I take that uh, metaphor seriously, uh, I see that I have many different tools uh, in that box, and some get used, and some don't get used. Uh, and religion, therefore, is part of that toolbox, but not the only toolbox. In this presentation, I didn't emphasize, which many of the research projects and reports emphasize, uh, it, it much less kind of, uh, because religion to me and culture are, are very sexy topics, right? Uh, and all, uh, but for example, consider Taiwanese entrepreneurs. I mean, the Chinese and the Taiwanese 
have created amazing transnational organizations. So there's slightly more boring than religious organizations. They fulfill the same purpose. They 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 rely. I didn't mean it. People who love Chinese organizations, uh, <laughs> the, 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 that they use their economic know-how and the whole cultural repertory associated to business and business formation. So religion is part and parcel of this process, but not the only one. When you look at the indigenous organizations, let me give you my favorite example, and this is totally responsible for me because it's not even part of research. So we had the annual convention of the American Sociological Association in the city of Denver uh, in August. And it was organized, of course, by the great, 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 great Eric, Eric, Eric Olin Wright, uh, who is like, you know, a man who believes in justice and has fought hard and has advised and been part of 50 dissertation committees and taught and written million books and so on and so forth. So it was not surprising that in that context, the opening session of the whole meeting uh, included uh, the performance of indigenous dances. Okay. Uh, is those of you who were there? Well, it turns out so. This was so suddenly, you know, here we are, kind of like being academic geeks and a kind of boring plus moment, and, 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 and drums start playing. And so you come out of the of the of the room, and you see all these people. Now I come from Mexico City, uh, so I immediately detected that the attire, well, not. Exactly right. Uh, and so, uh, uh, and when the and by the way, uh, my colleagues, uh, while they love the fact that the indigenous culture was being represented here, people who have uh, suffered oppression and been stigmatized and obliterated by capitalism, uh, they didn't like the drum so much because it interrupted conversation. <laughs> so, so it's true. So, so they, you know, they politely asked that there was a little recess while people gorged, put food in their mouths and drank and so on and so on. So I took that opportunity to go and interview the head Indian. The head Indian is a uh, proletarian individual from a city in Chihuahua uh, whose team has now reproduced Aztec dances. So that's what was uh, funny about the whole thing, that the headdresses have nothing to do. I, I share that uh, uh, image, and maybe I should have included this as part of the presentation. So these are folks from Chihuahua, that is a state that historically sends migrants to the United States, who intelligently understand that both tourists and liberally oriented academics <laughs> may be interested in indigenous cultures and the and, and frankly, they don't know much about indigenous cultures other than the Aztecs. So the Aztecs become the source of inspiration. You see what I'm saying? What, you think I'm making fun of uh, our uh, American conceits? No, Lourdes Arispe, a long time ago, uh, a wonderful Mexican anthropologist, uh, noticed the same thing. You know, the, the indigenous dances uh, in Mexico City uh, are, are performed by rural urban migrants mm -hmm. who have designed their outfits from the pictures in primary, public <laughs> primary school textbooks. You know so is that good? Beer this is good or bad? <laughs> <laughs> this is good or bad? This to me is fantastic because it brings in all kinds of questions about authenticity. But to me, what it mostly bespeaks is the imagination and the incredible creative capacity of people who can use cultural resources uh, in order to adapt to this new world. Jeff, did you want yeah, to say I something? Yeah, I wanted to just, um, I like what Doug Massey asked you about the um, globalization of Hinduism, and I was just thinking of uh, an earlier version Lord of globalization. Mm -hmm. Pardon? Lord Narasimha, the Avatar? No, 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 but I was thinking in the 19th century, I was wondering if you think about it as a legacy of the British Empire, all the Trinidadians, about fifty percent of Trinidad were South Asians, no, Hindus, um, South Africa. Yeah. When I was in Durban, this enormous Hindu temple still yeah. today. Obviously, the Anglo world would just be able, so easy to fit in yeah. in America with the, the British, the English speaking of. As, yeah. a, uh, as a I said, uh, this is in something, Uganda, with this is something that I'm, um, I'm still trying to understand better. But my impression is that there is a more discontinuity than continuity. I mean, this just happens to be a, a visual field that offers tremendous potential uh, for bringing in 
uh, both a sense of belonging in a spiritual field uh, without having to espouse uh, the kinds of institutions that we don't like so much. So that, that would be my sense. Professor Chase, did you want to ask something? Or you just wanted to raise your hand? No, no, no. Oh, I, what I was going to ask, we're, gonna, we're actually saving questions for you. Yeah, right. actually, <laughs> that's correct, because there is a seminar. So I think I'm going to say, is there, if there, is no, there are no other questions, uh, then we will end there. And I will take uh, other people's questions later. Thank you so much. <laughs> Whammy. Uh, in the sense that their credentials are not immediately recognized, but also they tend to be processed and folded into an African-American category, uh, which they often try to distance themselves from. Uh, professional and alumni associations are examples of this kind of organization uh, seeking to maintain dignity and uphold status. Uh, financial, in, both, in these cases, uh, they mobilize resources at both ends of the geographical spectrum. By resources, I'm referring to financial, human, and cultural resources to buttress action, strengthen social ties, uh, gain political power, or foster cultural repertories uh, that are instrumental in attracting public respect. Uh, here, uh, I also want to point out that uh, a second purpose of the paper is to emphasize the role of social class in the characteristics uh, of these organizations. Uh, highly educated groups, uh, including exiles, integrate to display their superior credentials <coughs> even when those are not fully recognized or valued in the country of destination. Uh, in those organizations, I see from the research conducted, tend to be proactive, and here the language fails me because I am not saying that working class organizations are not proactive, but I must distinguish their fundamental strivings in some way. Uh, so I use the term proactive in a narrow sense of the word uh, to indicate adjustments to the constraints imposed by receiving states. Uh, and by contrast, uh, skilled and semi-skilled immigrants are more likely to cluster in hometown associations and emphasize their connections with the country of birth. Uh, those organizations often fulfill a defensive function by contrast to proactive, although the two adjectives can be used uh, to designate uh, different activities that occur both in professional organizations, for example, and uh, in more humble organizations or hometown associations. The idea of defensive function is to shelter members from prejudice and marginalization. She usually does the introduction. So I, do. so I have a high standard to live up to. Yes. I introduce her. Um, but she's, um, she's um, as you know, she's been running a lot of um, these workshops. But this was the last time you presented at the workshop. No, 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 I was just, this is the very first time. The very first time. That uh, I offer a presentation as part of the uh, series uh, mm -hmm. Center for Migration and Development. But that's because uh, I've often uh, participated in the organization. I think it's déclassé. Put myself, <laughs> put myself in the program. Okay. But I did uh, this time. Good, good. So anyway, so Patricia, just if you have, if you don't know it already, because of course you know always asking these very thought-provoking questions in all our talks. But besides that, she is she's an intellectual and an activist, and I don't know how she does everything. Uh, she's very involved in immigration politics throughout the New Jersey area, and she's she's produced several books, including a couple that came out in the last year or two. Uh, and you have about three more that are coming out, it looks like pretty soon, so it's pretty amazing. Uh, and uh, she's, um, she's also, but that was is it your first book uh, that uh, became an Emmy Award winning film, uh, The Global Assembly Man. Uh, and so she's had this production, it's amazing. But if that's not enough, she also advises more undergraduate thesis than anybody uh, in the, in the uh, department. And, uh, That's not a plus. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a plus. It's a plus. I mean, she produces these great pieces. In this, in this context, it could be taken as a plus. Yeah. Plus for me? It's a plus. It's a plus for a lot of us. And it's a plus for the department. And uh, so anyway, so so without. Um,
way more and more about something that you probably all know very well. I am very excited to be here and to see so many dear and familiar faces, uh, including at least one of my favorite undergraduates. Uh, and I want to, uh, uh, and certainly many of my favorite graduates, graduate students, professors, associates of the CMD, my very dear uh, uh, partner in crime, Nancy Doolin, with whom I have uh, organized so many conferences. And, and by the way, speaking about conferences, um, we are going to be putting our heads together uh, to organize uh, a conference or roundtable we haven't decided yet on uh, uh, immigration and the military, which was Eddie's idea, uh, but uh, uh, which I look forward uh, to organizing. And I want to uh, say just a word, uh, a special welcome to uh, Craig uh, Eugene Phipps uh, from Casa Esperanza. He's a guerrilla filmmaker uh, who follows me around. Uh, he represents uh, one of my absolutely favorite uh, activist organizations online. Uh, and so if you're interested in the people who are doing excellent work uh, regarding justice and immigration, uh, you may want to go uh, on Facebook uh, and look at Casa Esperanza's uh, uh, webpage. They do magnificent work. And so I thank you all for being here. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to present my latest paper, which is not uh, fully completed. Uh, and, edit, and I generally don't do this, uh, because I do not believe in circulating drafts. Really, I don't. Uh, the reason is that people forget that they are drafts, uh, and therefore proceed to offer critiques as if they had already been published for a couple of years. Uh, however, this time I did uh, uh, re uh, uh, respond. I think this is the very first time in my whole life when I have actually circulated a paper uh, in draft form. And uh, uh, some of you who are in Eddie's uh, seminar with whom I look forward to having a longer conversation after the seminar uh, have already read it. Uh, and as uh, you know, uh, it is still missing uh, part of the final section and the conclusions, uh, as well as uh, a full bibliography. Uh, but uh, I, I do uh, look forward to an opportunity to basically uh, share with you and who, with those who have not read the draft uh, or what inspired me to write uh, this paper. The paper is really, uh, and I thought that the best way to do this today uh, is to just have that cover uh, uh, for the presentation. I'll just describe the content of the paper and the figure is all about. I consider first a horizontal vector, which of course is imaginary, uh, constituted by the actions of immigrants as part of organizations aiming to adjust to constraints and incentives both in countries of origin and in areas of settlement. And I note uh, the historical shifts uh, that immigrant organizations tend to experience over time, uh, regardless of national proven provenance. One of the things that is very interesting to me is how, although the details vary, uh, evolution tends to follow a, a particular pattern. Uh, whether these are Congolese and Belgium and France, uh, or Moroccans and Spain, or indigenous populations uh, in California uh, from Oaxaca, uh, they all tend to follow uh, a similar pattern. In early stages of settlement, uh, many of these organizations tend to be responses to political, socioeconomic, and even natural upheavals in countries of origin, earthquakes and floods have often been responsible for the formation of uh, organizations uh, in the United <laughs> States. Uh, they are formed by individuals uh, who strive uh, to maintain their connections with the motherland, uh, but also East settlement uh, in their adopted country. So from the outset in this paper, I want to signal the dual uh, uh, dynamics of these organizations, which are not just about adaptations to place of destination, uh, but also about the uh, retaining connections in places of origin. But as time passes and immigrants adjust to new conditions, organizations address other questions, including the search uh, for standing in the adopted nation. Uh, this is important because even professionals uh, tend to see their degrees and credentials devalued 
uh, in countries of arrival. Uh, this is particularly important in the case, for example, of uh, immigrants from Africa, who I will stress uh, uh, for reasons that I'll mention uh, later, uh, because, uh, say for example Nigerians or Kenyans who tend to come from professional uh, 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 milieus uh, and who therefore in places of destination uh, tend to face uh, a, a double then walk us uh, through some of the elements that I think are most uh, intellectually exciting to me. Uh, and then open the floor for conversation and for your suggestions. But if you did you if you found typos, uh, you, you, you have to understand I'm a little obsessive about this. If you found typos, kindly do not bring them to my attention. They <laughs> will be corrected. Uh, although I try to be careful about these things. The main purpose of this uh, paper is to take stock of three bodies of literature uh, which have been uh, separate until now but which I argue in this paper uh, have premises or are founded on premises and offer findings uh, that buttress new understandings about the role of immigrant organizations in places of origin and settlement. Uh, drawing from writings on globalization, immigrant assimilation, and transnationalism, I try to create a synoptic model whose objective is to clarify the causes, the functions, and the evolution of immigrant organizations. It's a large uh, task ahead, but my purpose is not really to focus on the details of uh, individual organizations, but rather to use the fabulous research that has been accomplished uh, uh, recently under the CEOPS uh, project, uh, spearheaded by Alex Cordes, uh, to really create some order and some understanding about the dynamics uh, that underline the formation of these transnational organizations and how they work, not just to do what we already know they, they do, which is to straddle borders and to uh, uh, connect uh, people in places of origin with institutions and individuals and groups in places of destination and back and forth, uh, but also to understand uh, beyond their developmental uh, functions, uh, other functions that they may they can be fulfilling. Uh, so it occurred to me that one good way to do this is to sort out major findings uh, from empirical uh, research uh, around two hypothetical axes, which I'll show you later uh, in a figure. Uh, but uh, this is what.